All right, chapter 30, Upper Digestive Tract Disorders. Now, according to our syllabus, I'm only supposed to talk halfway through this chapter and then the other half on Thursday, but I'm just going to go right through and you can stop me when you want and pick me up, pick it up when you want to. All right, so I hope you learned a lot uh, all about the basics of the digestive system, uh, top to bottom. And now we're just going to talk about some upper digestive disorders. So let's get going. So anorexia. Well, that is a lack of appetite. It doesn't necessarily mean a disorder. I'm not talking about anorexia nervosa. I'm just talking about anorexia, which is lack of appetite. So a good word to know, though. Um, causes could be nausea a decreased sense of taste or smell, mouth disorders, medications or some physical factors that can decrease one's appetite. So there are some medications that um, tend to do that to make you lose your appetite. Uh, the medical diagnosis, the physician uh, or dietitian assesses the patient for evidence of malnutrition so they weigh them so this patient should be weighed daily right uh, a complete history and physical exam are done to detect any underlying problems and the effects of inadequate intake and what are those well um, their weight their skin integrity their turgor their mucous membranes are they dehydrated think of all those things that we're going to be learning about also, some lab tests could be done. So a hemoglobin, total iron binding capacity, a TFEC, transferrin, calcium, folate, vitamin B12, and zinc. Tests of thyroid function may be ordered. Metabolic disorders, skin tests could be ordered. Uh, uh, also, occult blood if indicated. So something's wrong obviously maybe you're pregnant no not really um possible can cancers of the digestive system lungs and breasts can also cause anorexia and so is the treatment of those right so nutritional supplements sustacal some of those canned uh, drinks ensure may be ordered but oral root always the best always if a patient can eat, they should try to eat. Small feedings, not a lot at one time, but high protein, especially if they are uh, anorexic. So if they're gonna eat, it should be of, of good value, right? Um, they might need TPN, that peripheral nutrition that's put in the superior vena cava, going into the right atrium, diluted, Maybe they need some TPN for nutrition. Um, so let's talk about the nursing care of the patient. So factors such as discomfort, nausea, dental or other oral problems and emotional states should be assessed. Sometimes smells um, can really make you lose your appetite, right? That's why we always try to empty the trash, um, not leave the bathroom door open. Um, so, and then dental issues, if they've got a bad taste in their mouth, they're not going to want to eat. Depression can cause anorexia. So note the patient's height and weight for changes and trends. Might get a dietitian on board to see if she can help. Um, it's also helpful to identify factors if the patient has a dry mouth or a bad taste in their mouth. Oral hygiene. Uh, take care of their teeth and gums. And they have those sponge mouth applicators, not just the lemon glycerin swabs, but something that can really clean their mouth and tongue. Don't forget their tongue because uh, tongue can have infection and maybe it is a mouth infection that's causing the problem. Uh, maybe they've got sores down their throat. I've had patients um, 
would come in to the EGD or to our GI clinic and uh, they had an EGD done and they found sores in their esophagus, eosinophilic esophagitis. So uh, that that's like eosinophils had overrun the the uh, mucous membranes of the esophagus. So sometimes it's things that need to be looked into by the doctor, but things that we can do, right? to take care of them. So when a patient's nauseated, you might uh, make sure that their meal tray, make sure the urine uh, isn't sitting on the table, make sure their table's clean, make sure that things uh, smell good, look good. You know, vision, when you see something tasty, I don't know if anybody, I'll just throw this in, anybody seen a show, Hannibal, on TV? presentation of food is everything so Hannibal you know eats organs but the way he presents them oh you would never know so presentation 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 all right uh, a lot of people enjoy meals eating with other people so you take them to uh, the area where everybody's eating so they can eat with others or they see other people eating that encourages them to eat it's a social thing we know eating is a show social thing and that's one thing i know we all miss during this uh, quarantining is not being able to really uh, get together and have meals go out to dinner all right Again, small servings. So uh, what are some other feeding problems? Let me just go to the next slide. So determine the patient's ability to feed himself. Is he getting, is he able to feed himself? Is he getting the food to his mouth? Maybe he's not and that's why his weight is dropping. So be sure you assess his ability to feed himself. And also notice that I've seen this happen. So I'm just saying, sometimes people just plop the tray down in front of the patients. The patient can't reach it, so they don't eat. And then they're charted as no, not eating, right? Or sometimes I've seen them, the feeding, when they are feeding the patients, they're just shoving the food in. So don't do that because what's the patient going to do? Spit it all back out and then they're not getting anything. But I know sometimes people are in a hurry, but it's not, not a good excuse. Be sure the patient's sitting upright, can get to the tray, has a nice environment, maybe some music playing, you know, put them in the mood to eat. Um, be sure that they can swallow and chew without gagging. So watch them. Be sure maybe he's afraid. Of, you know, patients can be afraid. So there's some patients that they gagged one time or choked one time when they were alone and it scared them to death. So um, they, they're afraid to eat again. So what if that's the problem? You got to be a detective and figure this out. So we always want to encourage our patients to be as independent as possible and feed themselves. So we just want to remember to check the diet and the patient's name for accuracy. Seat the patient upright and the head tilted slightly forward for easier swallowing. Tuck a napkin or towel under the patient's chin to catch spills. Um, the patient's able to communicate, ask them what they would like. If the, what's on their tray they don't like, what would they like? Maybe they eat better if family brings food in from home. And if that's okay with the doctor, then you can ask, but there needs to be an order. Maybe once in a while they crave McDonald's. I don't know, but just be sure it's okay with the doctor. Um, some patients don't open their mouths voluntarily. They need a signal like almost childlike in the sense that touch the lips with the spoon or press down the lower lip to encourage them to eat. Also, don't feed them too fast, right? Be sure they've swallowed what they have in their mouth before you shove some more 
food in their mouth. Uh, check the mouth at intervals for accumulated food. And you know, maybe they need to have their teeth brushed, right? Once in a while, after, after food, before meal. Maybe they've got food that's been sitting there for a few days. So mouth care, really important. Offer fluids periodically, you know, just like you would when you're feeding yourself. You eat a little, drink a little, eat a little, drink a little. We'll do the same for your patients. Um, and after the completion of the meal, provide mouth care and record, document the food and drink that they've had. Stomatitis. So stomatitis is the inflammation of the stomach. Uh, it's a general term for inflammation of the oral mucosa that affects the gums, cheeks, lips, tongue, and roof of the mouth. It results from mechanical trauma of poorly fitting dentures, irritation of excessive alcohol or tobacco use, poor oral hygiene, inadequate nutrition, pathogens, radiation, disorders of the kidney, liver, or blood can cause stomatitis, emotional tension, fatigue, so stomatitis is a general term for inflammation of the oral mucosa, medical treatment directed towards finding the cause and eliminating it. You might start with a soft, bland diet, something they can tolerate. And remember again, small amounts. If their mouth is hurting, they're not gonna be able to eat a lot, but feed them more frequently. So gentle oral hygiene, as far as nursing care, mouthwashes, administer medications as ordered. Maybe if you can follow medicine, some medicine doesn't taste good, you know. Uh, maybe follow it with a little pudding, a little sauce, so they don't have that bad taste. Steroids are terrible tasting. So if they're on an oral steroid, they might need something uh, afterwards to take that bad taste out of their mouth. So periodontal disease, gingivitis. Gingivitis is the inflammation of the gums and can progress to other structures. Uh, inf inflamed gums are typically swollen, painful, and bleed easily. Um, abscesses can develop, uh, bad teeth. You know, you get a bad taste in your mouth when which kind of goes back to stomatitis, but uh, bad taste in your mouth uh, from food stuck in your teeth or your gums not being taken care of. Maybe there's an infection. So as far as nursing care, um, note the diet, frequency of dental exams and mouth care practices. Are there any teeth missing or broken teeth? And caries, how's their, how their teeth, redness or lesions. Remember, a lot of people forget to take good care of their teeth. They didn't learn how in the beginning. Um, most dental and gum disorders are treated by dentists in their office. So you can get a, an order for the patient to go to the dentist if you see that there's an issue. And you got a pen light, you can look in there. Maybe you can see something that you notice is not good. Okay. Oral cancer. So it's the most life-threatening disorder affecting the mouth. Two types of malignant tumors develop in the mouth, squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. So risk factors are important to know. And I wrote it up here on the slide, tobacco and alcohol use. It mentions a few others in the book. 
Uh, cancer of the lip is related to prolonged exposure to irritants. Sun, wind, and pipe smoking. Also, uh, chewing tobacco, you no know, tucked in to the mouth. That's a problem. And when I say tobacco right here in risk factors, uh, it could be chewing tobacco. Uh, also, uh, poor nutritional status and chronic irritations. Signs and symptoms would be a tongue irritation, a pain in the tongue, or even the radiating up to the ear. You might even see some lesions or ulcerations, thickened or rough areas. If you've ever noticed, uh, when you go to the dentist, he checks your whole mouth. He checks the under your lips, under your tongue, everywhere, because he also is checking for oral cancers or any unusual looking things in your mouth. Uh, some other things that can be found would be uh, thickened or rough areas, sore spots, leukoplakia, leuko, white, so white patches in the mouth. That is considered a pre-malignant condition. Uh, they might need to do a biopsy to confirm diagnosis. And when a malignancy is confirmed, the healthcare provider often orders endoscopic exams so they can see if there's any evidence of metastasis. And then depending on the extent of the cancer, treatment would include surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy, or a combination, uh, sometimes surgery. So if they do have an oral cancer that's been diagnosed, your nursing care would be to um, focus on their mouth for lesions, assess the neck for limitation of movement and enlarge lymph nodes. Now there is a uh, picture here, figure 38.1 in your book. And I hope you're following with me in your book. I'm on page 723 now. Um, and this is an approach to surgery of the oral cavity for cancer. It's a radical neck dissection. Now, this could be done for an oral cancer that's metastasized. It's a pretty radical, and as, as it says, it's a pretty radical surgery. I've seen some pretty bad ones. Um, they don't always heal real well. That's not a an area that's easy to heal. All right, some um, interventions that you might do would be mouth care, if you can, depends on uh, type of surgery. So uh, dry mouth can be a problem after radiation. So do good mouth care, temperature, you might have to do tympanic or rectal root. They also have, you know, the forehead temperature now, but don't put a thermometer in the mouth, basically, is what they're saying here. Um, maybe certain rinses for their mouth. Uh, one solution that soothes and cleanses is half hydrogen peroxide and half normal saline. Another is made by mixing half teaspoon of baking soda in eight ounces of water. And always good hydration. Uh, to keep up their oral mucosa. So air, airway obstruction is another problem that they could uh, encounter. Edema, secretions, and an enlarging tumor, 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 tumor can cause obstruction of the airway. So monitor the patient's respiratory status uh, frequently and report signs of inadequate oxygenation. So their O2 saturation, their restlessness, tachycardia, their uh, rate of respirations, type of respirations, is it deep, is it shallow? If edema or bleeding is present, elevate the head of the bed. Steroids may be ordered to decrease inflammation. So remember steroids, now they, they can be given IV in this instance, not orally. So um, they can be given IV. but they might decrease inflammation and production of secretions. 
Oral suction might be ordered to remove secretions that might be aspirated. Also, they might have some swallowing problems, so a yank or suction is a good thing. Maybe just at the bedside, the patient can do it themselves if they're alert enough. Pain might be an issue, uh, so you want to give them pain medication. And also keep an eye on their graft. Uh, could be a donor graft or just some skin. See the picture. In this picture here, the patient has a drain, a couple of drains. So that's very uncomfortable. So we want to keep them comfortable. Uh, besides drugs, we could do relaxation, mental imagery, other strategies. Adequate nutrition, so if the patient's able to swallow, a soft or liquid diet may be prescribed. Mouth care, before and after, uh, helps their appetite. If they have a feeding tube, uh, you need to manage that feeding tube. Or gastrostomy tube. What's the difference? So a nasal gastric tube goes in the nose, right? And a gastrostomy tube just goes right into the stomach. Monitor their I and O. Record daily weights and assess adequate intake. Uh, with large tumors, it cannot be completely re removed. Or after extensive oral surgery, the feeding tube may be needed indefinitely. So they have little tubes. The ones that you maybe put in uh, during skills lab, they have other ones that they can use they have a little tip on the end, kind of a weighted tip, and it also uh, can be picked up by x-ray so they can see if that tube is in place because it's not a tube. The tube is so small that you can't aspirate it. So uh, they do have those kind of tubes. They're not as uncomfortable to the patient either. Impaired oral communication. So be sure, sure, sure that the patient can communicate with you. Um, if it's, I had a patient uh, that had a radical neck, couldn't communicate, but he could write like crazy. So he wrote like pages of questions and, and requests, I won't call them demands, I'll call them requests, uh, to make him more comfortable because how else? You know, you can get tired trying to point back, you need a pillow and have somebody trying to guess what you're trying to say. So he would just write it out and then you'd read it and then you would respond. And that's helpful. Uh, patients who can't do that, maybe they're too weak. Maybe you have a board or um, pictures that you can point to. Maybe that different things that they might need, water, glass of water, a picture of water, or a picture of a pillow or a picture of a light. Different things that they can try to communicate, work up a, a pattern. Um, I saw a movie once where the patient had a little bell, a dinging bell, and they would ding it once for yes and two for no. So you can ask questions and the patient could ding it once for yes and two for no. It's just another way of communication. So try different things. Now the patient with oral cancer might have a body image disturbance, might have impaired speech, inability to eat, and an altered with that radical neck surgery, that is definitely an alteration in the way they look. Um, assure the patient that edema related to surgery will resolve. Uh, some disfigure may be permanent. Uh, some patients, you know, they'd rather be alive. They care that they're alive more than they care how they look. But some people do care how they look there, and they know that other people are going to stare at them. So you got to be sensitive to their feelings and not discount that. Um, encourage the patient to re resume grooming. Make them feel good. Make them feel like themselves. Lotion on them. If, you know, if they need, they're used to putting lotion on, like a woman, nice smelling lotion. or uh, Make them feel good about themselves. Uh, patients with open lesions or surgical incisions are at risk for infections. We always have to remember that. If tissue has been grafted, the patient's donor site is a potential site for infection. It could be a site for 
rejection as well. So always check for signs and symptoms of infection, fever, redness, swelling, perineal drainage. There might be prophylactic antibiotics ordered. If you do notice any irregularities, be sure you no notify uh, the RN or physician because you are the eyes and ears. Now, notice there's a patient teaching box that talks about oral cancer prevention. So this might be good for some people. Uh, avoid known risk factors, tobacco and alcohol, excessive sun exposure. So you know how we talk about suntan lotion? Well, I, from personal experience too, I put on suntan lotion, but I forgot to put lip, lip block on my lips. So don't forget that some lip glosses have uh, an SPF in them, and that prevents the lip cancer too. All right, so let's go on to the next one. Parotitis, inflammation of the parotid glands, and those parotid glands are below the ear next to the lower jaw. You can kind of, Feel it's almost like where you think your tonsil that inflammate or I don't mean that the gland right below your ear it's right in that area uh, the pain increases during eating it's treated with antibiotics mouthwashes and warm compresses uh, surgical drainage or removal might be necessary so always re uh, remember to monitor the patient's temperature and comfort level and report any swelling of the infected gland. Achalasia. So achalasia is characterized by progressively worsening dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. Now, patients can get this at any age. I had like a, this 12-year-old guy who had this uh, achalasia. Um, it's caused by failure of the lower esophageal muscles and sphincter to relax during swallowing. Um, it could be a neuromuscular defect affecting the esophageal muscles. So conservative cares avoid restrictive clothing, identification uh, of the position that works best for eating, elimination of specific foods that cause a problem with swallowing, there can be drug therapy, esophageal dilation with it. The doctor goes in with a scope and dilates uh, the esophagus. But you know, that can only be done so many times, right? Uh, especially if it's frequent. Um, corrections could be mechanical dilation, surgical cutting of the lower esophageal sphincter. So actually a yes, surgery can help it. And in this young man, it did. Um, one of the things with him was he had a uh, bad breath and because he just couldn't swallow his food. So he always had like eructation or burping of his food. So, uh, he had a bad breath and he didn't have very many friends because of that. So at age 12, he had this and he, once he had his surgery, I mean, he's a grown man now, married and with kids, so he did great, but um, it was something that had to be overcome. All right. Esophageal cancer. All right, pathophysiology of that. Uh, cancer of the esophagus isn't common, but when it does occur, it has a poor prognosis. Most esophageal cancers are located in the middle or lower portion of the esophagus. And this could be diagnosed with an EGD. And of course, you would probably have signs and symptoms of that. Uh, difficulty swallowing, pain. And you can have pain not just in the uh, with swallowing, but also epigastric in the back, jaws, ear, or shoulder. You might have massive weight loss, not only because you can't swallow, but also because cancer, you know, takes a lot of uh, 
our body's energy up. So we you tend to have weight loss with cancers. That is one of the symptoms actually of cancer. So let me just go back up to part of that pathophysiology. Um, factors can be cigarette smoking, excessive alcohol intake, trauma, chronic trauma, uh, poor oral hygiene and eating spicy foods. So let's look at this cultural considerations box. What does culture have to do with esophageal cancer? Well, in the United States, the incidence of esophageal cancer is greater among African-American men than among Caucasian men and is related to tobacco use and dietary factors. Interesting, isn't it? All right. Uh, so we talked about signs and symptoms. Medical diagnosis would be made with a barium swallow or a CT scan. Medical and surgical treatment, they might have esophagectomy, so their esophagus, uh, all or part of it, might be removed. They can have a graft put in. I've seen uh, the stomach lifted up. They've actually taken out part of the esophagus and the stomach raised up to meet the esophagus. Um, and then the esophagastrectomy, where they have to remove all this, the lower part of the esophagus and part of the stomach. Uh, colon interposition where they have a replacement of the disease part of the esophagus with a segment of the colon. So that's interesting. Um, it helps give them some more esophagus, some length. We have a lot of intestine we don't use, right? Small intestine especially, so it might work really good there. Uh, maintaining good nutrition is a challenge. Uh, they might need a feeding tube, a gastrostomy tube, or TPN. A medical and surgical treatment. So notice here on the slide what I have under nursing care. Eat small meals and tilt the head forward for easier swallowing. It goes with a lot of our upper GI situations, doesn't it? All right, so be sure that you observe the patient while they're eating just to be sure that they can swallow okay. And, um, Assess for the presence of hoarseness, cough, anorexia, weight loss, and regurgitation, or the burping. So one of their uh, nursing diagnoses I might give here is inadequate nutrition, right? Because they can't swallow as much or get as much nutrition down. So what would be my answer to that? Eat small meals. That's a mantra here with this, okay? Um, so we want to notice their height and weight. All right, and we get down to interventions. We want to administer analgesics, uh, inadequate nutrition. As I said before, be sure that you uh, Tilt their head forward. That's on page 726, right at the bottom in your book. Word for word, right there. Uh, also, the position, uh, putting the head down makes it easier to swallow. So be sure you get them in the right position so they swallow and decrease their risk of aspiration. They're anxious. And remember our therapeutic communication in any of these instances. So I think I'm going to, you know, if the patient's going to be pretty negative, they might be. And they might be pretty sad. So, you know, how am I ever going to, nobody's ever going to look at me again. Nobody, and they're going to have this negative thought. And, and how do you answer that? Well, you go, well, what makes you think that? You know, what makes you feel that way? Find out what their deep down fear is. And it's not like, oh no, it's, everybody, it's just gonna be fine. Everybody loved you before, they're gonna love you now. They don't wanna hear that. You know, it doesn't calm them down. So you want that therapeutic nursing communication. 
remember that because they have had surgery, they're at risk for injury. So they've had, they have incisions, monitor for signs and symptoms of hemorrhage, which would be restless tachycardia hypotension. This is another thing that's going to keep coming up. So learn it now, right? Risk for infection or hypo, hypo, um, hypovolemia, no, those signs and symptoms, no signs and symptoms of a hemorrhage. Hemorrhage, in this case, restless tachy, uh, tachycardia hypotension. And symptoms of hemorrhage are similar to symptoms of hypovolemia, aren't they? Because you ha don't have as much volume as you normally would. Now, symptoms of bleeding, you might see excessive swallowing or you might see a more drainage on the dressing, so it would be more evident that they're bleeding, but maybe they're bleeding internally. So, uh, inadequate oxygenation, remember we've got that esophagus next to our trachea, so could have, if we have swelling from this surgery, could affect the breathing. And some patients have stents in their neck or in their esophagus. Uh, a stent placed in the esophagus should be, now this is the top of page 727, okay? Uh, the first column. Patients who have stents placed in the esophagus should be told how to reduce the risk of regurgitation. Guess what? Instruct them to eat small meals and to remain upright for several hours after meals. And knowledge deficit. So knowledge is power. So it's important to prepare the patient for discharge. I like to always prepare them before surgery if you can to know what to expect. So when they wake up and they have tubes or drains that they've been already told that they might have that. And remember, doctors don't always tell them everything. So it's up to us to allay their fears and be calm. Doctors are rushed. We need to be calm and always uh, be there for our patients. Um, and know that, uh, point out the characteristics of the healing incisions and teach the patient the signs of wound complications that should be reported and talk about feedings, the different types of feedings that they might have to have. Uh, also, the importance of small, high-calorie, high-protein meals. So, nausea and vomiting is our next thing that we're going to talk about. Um, nausea and vomiting usually occur together. Vomiting emesis is the forceful expulsion of stomach contents through the mouth. It occurs when the vomiting reflex in the brain is stimulated. You know, it's at the back of the head. So sometimes when patients are have nausea, a cool wash rag at the back of their neck, that's right where their uh, nausea center is. So that might help for a nursing measure. And regurgitation is the gentle ejection of food or fluid without nausea or retching. So some complications. A prolonged or severe vomiting can lead to significant loss of fluids and electrolytes. Dehydration, metabolic alkalosis can develop because they're getting rid of their acid in their stomach. So that's why it's alkalosis. I know a lot of it, a lot of sicknesses or illnesses lead us to acidosis, but in this case, when stomach acid is involved, it would develop an alkalosis. Uh, the patients might be very weak from vomiting so much. Uh, medical treatment, we want to try some uh, medications, antiemetics. Most antiemetic drugs have multiple uses. They have local effects, absorbance that may act on the central nervous system, or they may act in more than one way. If they act on the central nervous system, what's going to happen? They might be dizzy. They might be sleepy. 
right? And notice that um, on the slide, some common causes of nausea and vomiting. Headaches, ever had a migraine? Viral infections, heart attack. Heart attacks can cause, that can be a sign, especially in women. Uh, severe pain anywhere. Some abdominal sources, appendicitis, hepatitis, kidney disease, gallbladder issues, pregnancy, motion sickness, alcohol poisoning, food poisoning, or medications can all cause nausea and vomiting. So uh, anyway, centrally acting antiemetics include anticholinergics, antihistamines, phenothiazines, and marijuana derivatives. So marijuana is becoming more uh, common as medication. A friend of mine worked at a facility where instead of giving sleeping pills, where there were a lot of side effects, patients got so groggy and then they'd fall and have that problem, they gave them marijuana like a little piece of chocolate and it put them right to sleep, it relaxed them, they didn't wake up and fall. They didn't have all the side effects of medication. So uh, marijuana has long been used for nausea in chemo patients. Now they make it uh, easier, more accessible. It's legal in California. So you might begin to see that more in facilities. All right, so remember the examples of drugs on the table 37.2. A common side effect uh, is drowsiness. They can, because they act on the CNS, they can also cause tachycardia, hypotension, constipation, urinary retention, and dry mouth. Menta, many antiemetics are contraindicated in patients with glaucoma myocardial infarction, bowel, or urinary obstruction, and pregnancy. So a patient might need IV fluids because they're dehydrated because they've had so much coming out. They need IV fluids to put fluid back in them. Uh, we want to do a good nursing assessment and note their skin turgor the color of their, and the amount of their vomiting, if they are vomiting, if they have an NG tube, we wanna measure that amount, note the color and amount, and document that somewhere, and that's all output. So it can be green, it can be red. If it's red, that's a problem, right? It's red, red could be bloody. So, but you wanna note the color. And when you document the color that was on your shift, and then the next shift comes along, the patient vomits and it's a different color, they're going to know there's been a change. So that's why documentation is so, so important. All right. Uh, so bright red blood, you know, that's like bleeding, right? But if it's black or coffee ground, that's old blood. That means it's been there and that can make you nauseous, boy. Blood in your stomach. So it can come out as coffee ground, and that's coffee ground emesis. That's how that would be documented. Okay, I'm turning the page uh, to page 728, but still talking about our nausea and vomiting. Um, an intervention advised the patient to take deep breaths and swallow. So I want to come down, though, to the complementary and alternative therapies. This is important to know. I told you a lot of these boxes and tables and figures are really important and the complementary and alternative therapies. So ginger root, maybe some of you have had the pregnancy, nausea during pregnancy, no ginger. Ginger ale is good for nausea. Ginger root, ginger tea is good for nausea. It's calming. It's even, um, you know, essential oils. They have ginger that you can put in water and drink that, and that's supposed to help with nausea. Even rubbing it on the topic on topical skin, it's supposed to help. Anyway, back to this. Sorry, uh, ginger root is effective in calming upset stomach, 
reducing flatulence and preventing motion sickness. However, be aware that it enhances the action of anticoagulants and antiplatelets. So that's really important to know. Ginger root is good for nausea, but it can cause bleeding. It enhances the action of anticoagulants and antiplatelets. So it's not like it causes bleeding out of nowhere. They're probably already on something that's an antiplatelet, and even if it's aspirin for a heart, heart problem that they have had. Okay, we'll go to the next page. Hiatal hernia. So pathophysiology of that is um, essentially it's an opening in the diaphragm through which the esophagus passes. The hiatal hernia is the protrusion of the lower esophagus and stomach upward through the diaphragm and into the chest. There's two types. There's a sliding hernia and a paraesophageal or rolling hernia. In the sliding hernia, the gastroesophageal junction is above the hiatus or the high part of the stomach there. Um, lost my place. Sliding hernias are common associated with gastroesophageal reflux or GERD. Weakness of the esophageal sphincter permits gastric fluids to flow backward into the esophagus, uh, which gastric acids can cause inflammation of the esophagus. In a rolling hernia, the gastroesophageal junction remains in place, but a portion of the stomach herniates up through the diaphragm through a secondary opening. Complications would include ulcerations, bleeding, and aspiration of stomach, stomach contents. <clears throat> causes, causes could be a weakness of the muscles of the diaphragm in the area where the esophagus and the stomach join. Factors that contribute to the development of hiatal hernia include intra-abdominal pressure, uh, if they have liver problems or some other problem that's made their stomach large. Trauma, long-term bed rest in a reclining position. Intra-abdominal pressure increased by obesity, pregnancy, abdominal tumors, ascites, and repeated heavy lifting. That's why they wear those belts. You know, they, they wear a belt so they don't get a hernia if they're weightlifters. Uh, straining also. Signs and symptoms. So uh, fullness, dysphagia, eructation. I used that word earlier. Good word means belching. Regurgitation and heartburn. Heartburn is a feeling of burning and tightness from the lower sternum to the throat. Have you guys ever experienced that? Sometimes after eating spicy foods or when you lay down at night, you can feel that. It's bothersome. So diagnosis is made, um, testing, procedures, EGD, a barium swallow, CT scan, esophageal manometry measures the pressures in the stomach and the esophagus. Now I'm on page 729, and it has the same pictures that are up on the slides there. Same pictures. But it also shows what the surgery is, a Nissan fundoplication um, for a hiatal hernia. So it's where they uh, actually tie up the opening. They put sutures around the... the uh, hernia so it doesn't come up through the diaphragm. All right, uh, so besides the Nissan fund application, they also have the angel Schick prosthesis, which is actually just uh, almost like a ring that goes around to prevent the uh, stomach from going up through the diaphragm. Nursing care, eat small meals. 
right? We've got to give them pain, of course, medication for pain. If they've had surgery, I'm going to give them some pain medication. Um, they are at risk for aspiration, so be sure that they're sitting at the right way, you know, sitting up, head down. Uh, don't give them anything two to three hours before bedtime. This reduces reflux of stomach contents during sleep. They should sleep with their head a bit elevated. They do have wood blocks. I know at Bed Bath & Beyond, they have these blocks that you can actually put under under uh, the legs of the head of the bed. And then inadequate nutrition. So advise the patient to eat small frequent meals because large meals increase pressure in the stomach and delay gastric emptying. All right. And then post-op care, just be sure that you uh, check for breathing, turn, cough, deep breathe. Be sure that they're comfortable and make they might need an IV until their bowel sounds return. Let's go to GERD. Good old GERD. Pathophysiology. Now, you, you know, you hear it all the time, right? You may know people that say they have reflux, but it really is called gastroesophageal reflux disease. It can be a disease. There's a lot of people on medication for it. It's, it's uncomfortable, that's for sure. And you know, if you watch TV, uh, some of the commercials will say, if you have reflux for more than three times a week, you need to tell your doctor because you may need to be on medication because if you avoid being treated, it can lead to cancer. So it does need to be treated. Don't ignore it. And don't always eat those tacos or whatever those taquito. What are those things called? The the really spicy. I know they're yummy. Taquitos? No. Taki? Whatever they are. I don't eat them, but um, they are yummy. I've tasted them. So I know a lot of uh, you guys may eat spicy foods or eat spicy chips, but this is something to keep in mind about GERD, okay? All right, so what's the pathophysiology? Well, it's a weakness of the esophageal sphincter, which permits the gastric fluids to go upward. And you can see this is a great picture of the acid going up into the esophagus, and it creates inflammation because it's not supposed to be there. The lining of the esophagus, A, doesn't want anything coming back up and B, it doesn't want anything irritating. So it's not good for you. So that's the pathophysiology and then prolonged vomiting and prolonged gastric intubation can also cause GERD. So I, I, I went to the next slide, sorry, because I'm not really done talking about GERD. A lot of patients that are in ICU they should be on prophylactic medication for reflux because they just by the amount of being stressed out, they are gonna have excess gastric acid and they might reflux that up into their esophagus and get GERD. So intermittent, uh, Dysphagia and belching can be a sign and symptom of GERD besides just the burning. So it's not always just burning that they can complain of. It can be dysphagia as well or belching. So medication, the best one is the proton pump inhibitor like Prilosec, um, Asifex, Protonix. Those are all proton pump inhibitors. I would look back and get familiar with those. Those usually do need a doctor's order. So I'm just trying to go back to that page. 
it is on page. Sorry. 7 11. 7 come 11. So proton pump inhibitors, Prilosec, Nexium, Prevacid, Protonics, and Asifex. Those are first line. Those are the best because they work right where um, it doesn't let the acid even be made to be irritating the patient. Um, the H2 blockers would uh, just block the secretion of acid, but it's not 100%. The fact that it's over the counter tells you that eh, it's okay. You can use it, and so and it, you know what? If it works, great. Use it. Some proton pump inhibitors can cause problems. So um, if you can, if it the least medication like that H2 blockers, if that works best for you, then use that. That that would that would be great. All right, so let's go to gastritis. Uh, the pathophysiology is it's the inflammation of the lining of the stomach. Theory of the inflammation and the depth of the stomach tissue if affected vary with different types of gastritis. So things that can cause that would be um, gastritis, helicobacter pylori, that infection in the stomach that has to be treated with antibiotics and proton pump inhibitors, it doesn't just go away. So the type of gastritis associated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, stress and alcohol tends to affect deeper tissue and is more prone to hemorrhage. That's important, that's interesting. The role of diet in gastritis is not completely understood some foods such as red and black pepper can cause superficial erosions in the gastric mucosa. Little a bit about chili pepper there in small amounts stimulates mucus production, but in large amounts can damage the mucosa. Again, isn't that cultural? How much spice you put in your food can really affect if you have stomach issues. All right, um, chronic gastritis type A is induced by immune mechanisms. Changes in the stomach lining with chronic atrophic gastritis result in decreased production of acid and intrinsic factor, which is needed for the absorption of B12. It's interesting. Also, without intrinsic factor, a serious condition called pernicious anemia develops. The management of pernicious anemia, we'll talk about it another time. All right, so um, look at, let's look at the pharmacological capsule here. Although the parenteral forms of vitamin B12 is traditionally used to treat pernicious anemia, research has shown that it can be treated with high dose oral B12. Signs and symptoms, uh, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, pain in the stomach. Medical diagnosis, let's look at that again. H. pylori popped up again. That little infection. It can be uh, confirmed by breath, urine, or stool test. That's true, but they're not 100%. Now the doctor may want to do just a breath H. pylori test and treat you for it anyway. But the best way is EGD with biopsy, but whatever the doctor says, and sometimes less invasive is better, right? All right, because H. pylori has been associated with gastric and duodenal ulcers. Remember, duodenum is what comes right out of the stomach, the small intestine that comes outside of the stomach. Um, that's the most common place for ulcers. Now, just of interest, I'll tell you the little story that um, the doctor that discovered H. pylori, he actually discovered it on himself. He scoped himself 
and found this infection. And then he found it to be true that this infection was the most common cause of ulcers. So it kind of, oh, let's see, what year was that? That it became really vogue. Vogue, I say vogue, but I don't mean that. Uh, it just means popular, a popular diagnosis and, and, and a true diagnosis too. Uh, people didn't know before. I'd say 1980, maybe 1990s. So it's a fairly new phenomenon. Uh, the medical treatment would be um, if you if it's NSAIDs, you need to stop that. If it's alcohol, you need to stop that. Elimination of the cause essentially is what we're talking about. Bland diet six small feedings, uh, failure to correct or control gastritis, or if the patient is hemorrhaging, uh, then that moves into another field of peptic ulcer disease. All right, so I'll let you read through the nursing care of the patient with gastritis. Uh, you need assessment, pain medication, and part of that is would be medication uh, like the H2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors. Be sure they're getting good nutrition, nothing spicy. It should be bland foods, soft foods, something easy on their stomach. Uh, the fluid volume deficit, be sure they're getting enough fluids so they're not dehydrated. And they could be, and if they're bleeding, they could be, and you know, okay, bleeding so what if they're not vomiting blood what if they're bleeding just from like you know how when you fall on your skin your knee and every time you bend it it bleeds a little bit or it hurts well that's similar to gastritis the lining is irritated and um, every time it foods in there or anything it could get irritated again so you, the patient may not vomit blood but what if it has a little bit of bleeding? It's going to come out in the stool. And then in the stool will be black. So old blood is always black. Bright red blood, of course, is fresh blood. And that's whether it comes up or goes down, out the rectum. The, the rule is the same. All right, let's go to the next thing about peptic ulcer disease because we have some things to say here. So what's the pathophysiology? Well, it's a loss of tissue from the lining of the digestive tract. Um, it's a bar you know, your stomach has a barrier and when that barrier is worn through, when the lining is worn out, then you can get a lesion or an ulcer. Peptic ulcers are classified as gastric, so in the stomach, as you see in the picture of the slide here, uh, the little hole in the stomach, or the duodenal ulcer is the other type of ulcer. About 80% of ulcers are in the duodenum. Causes um, could be drugs, infections, stress, medication, H. pylori, uh, stressful events, spicy foods, signs and symptoms. So this is important to know some signs and symptoms. Sometimes you can have nausea and pain and a lot of times it's uh, burning in the epigastric one to two hours after meals. But if a patient has an ulcer and has no pain, but then develops a burning or stabbing, cramping pain. It could be a, a, a rupture, like a bleeding ulcer. Okay, so like a stabbing, burning pain in a patient who with a known ulcer could be a sign or symptom that there's a problem. And I think I have a, under complications, yeah, I wanted you to look at the table down there, table 38.2. There's different depths of the ulcers, shallow, 
So burning and pressure in the abdomen, hemorrhage, perforation, and obstruction is a complication. So if they experience burning or cramping pain two to four hours after meals, it could be a problem. And know that if the hemorrhage is not brought under control, patient can bleed to death. I had a patient who had a bleeding ulcer and also vomited it up and it shot across the room and there was blood everywhere. I mean, it can, mat it can hit a blood vessel and majorly bleed. So it's, you think an ulcer isn't that bad, but it can be. And it, when a patient's stressed out, even in the hospital with another illness, they can develop a peptic ulcer. So always keep an eye on a patient and no signs and symptoms of bleeding and signs and symptoms of ulcers and and notice eating and drinking all those things uh, adding up right giving you a diagnosis so i want you to notice complications also um, peptic ulcers can lead to life-threatening complications hemorrhage is not brought under control patient can bleed to death um, the other thing that can happen is if the patient if the break in the wall of the stomach goes into the abdomen and food goes into the abdomen then you could have an in uh, peritonitis that's where food or even the acid can irritate and it can cause um, scarring inside the abdomen as well if it's not caught right away so peritonitis and that's the fluids or food even going into the peritoneal cavity and remember the pylorus is the opening between the stomach and the duodenum so with peptic ulcer disease pyloric obstruction can develop as a result of edema and scarring uh, medical diagnosis, so barium swallow, gastroscopy, EGD, some tests for H. pylori can be, a, a, as I said before, breathing, lab test, stool test for H. pylori. Um, drugs would be um, treating H. pylori if that's the problem. H2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors, prostaglandins are examples of anti-secretory drugs. Cytotec is that uh, prostaglandin inhibitor. Multiple antibiotics are needed to prevent the development of resistant strains if it's uh, the H. pylori. And that, that brings me back to that other thing that always pops up and that's take your medicine the way it's supposed to be taken. Take all your antibiotics to the very last one because you don't want to develop a resistant strain. So let's look at the um, complications of peptic ulcer disease. I want you, to, that's on table 38.3 on page 734. So perforation so we have hemorrhage perforation obstruction so under perforation a sudden sharp epigastric pain that's very symptomatic very important to know in peptic ulcer disease so like i was saying if you have somebody who has a known peptic ulcer disease and then complains of a sudden sharp pain like that it could, it's a problem they're going to start uh, crumping, as we used to say, going down the tubes, um, drop their blood pressures, get tachycardic uh, pretty quick from the bleeding. All right. Um, I also think I have here that uh, diet therapy, frequent small meals, surprise. And then uh, perforation is treated with gastric decompression, IV fluids, and antibiotics. I am on page 734. 
the just above the table on the second pair, the second uh, column. All right, so let's go to 735 though. Nursing care of the patient with peptic ulcer managed medically. So that's, of course, medically meaning medication. Um, there's a good nursing care plan there. Patient with peptic ulcer. And, you know, the, those critical thinking questions are in your, um, your student resources in Elsevier. So if you want to test yourself, uh, you can always find the answer there. All right. So I kind of wanted to go, let's, let's just make a little jump here on page 737 down to focus assessment. This is uh, managing the paper with pep, the paper. I guess that's why the, I'm only supposed to do half a chapter, right? Um, nursing care of the patient with peptic ulcer managed surgically. So if they have to have surgery, you're going to have your typical surgical things that you have to do. Cough and deep breathe, vital signs, IV fluids, INO, oscillate breath sounds because we don't want any uh, pneumonia. You know, and if they've had abdominal surgery, remember, you can build them a pillow or a, uh, take a draw a sheet and wrap it up like a square, something for support so that they can cough. It's because any kind of surgery is going to hurt when they cough. So have them hold on to it and then have them cough. <coughs> right? Nice deep breath and expulsion of air. And always inspect their wound for uh, bleeding. Well, we're not quite there yet, are we? Gastric cancer. Almost. So, nutrition. Be sure that they get their uh, after gastric surgery. I'm on page 738, by the way. I'm, I'm down now to inadequate nutrition. It's a common thing with stomach, right? Vitamin B12, folic acid, iron, calcium, vitamin D. Uh, they might develop pernicious anemia because of lack of absorption due to their stomach problems. All right. And then there's a patient teaching for peptic ulcer post-op there. You can read through. Decreased cardiac output. So let, let's go over that for a second. So that's page 738, decreased cardiac output. Some patients experience dumping syndrome. Remember that from talking earlier? After gastric surgery, the symptoms of dumping syndrome may occur in stages. In the first stage, the patient experiences abdominal fullness and nausea. These symptoms are thought to be distension of the small intestine by the consumed food. The patient feels flushed and faint. The heart races. Patient breaks into a sweat. So this is a different description of the same thing, but the same things happen, right? In dumping syndrome. So these symptoms are probably related to the malabsorption of carbohydrates and other foodstuffs because of deficiency of digestive enzymes. We talked about it when we talked about two feedings, I think. All right, so uh, just go down just above stomach cancer, and it talks about um, dumping syndrome usually disappears within a few months. Meanwhile, the following directions for the patient will help. Consume a diet low in carbs and refined sugars, moderate in fat and moderate to high in protein. Small, frequent meals. Drink fluids between meals. Lie down for about 30 minutes after meals. And I, that doesn't mean flat. Keep your head elevated. Okay, let's go to the stomach cancer. Uh, pathophysiology. Uh, 
Cancer of the stomach is expected to be diagnosed in more than 26,000 people in the United States. The incidence is highest among men, people older than 70, and people of lower socioeconomic status. Asians and Pacific Islanders, African Americans and Latinos are at great risk. So it says go down to the cultural considerations box. So let's do that. Um, the incidence of stomach cancer in African American men is greater than in Caucasians. In addition, culturally based dietary patterns, in other words, high intake of starch, salt, pickled foods, salted meats, and nitrates. Nitrates is a very bad thing. It's cancer causing. Increase the risk of stomach cancer. So, you know, nitrates are in some good foods. I know we like hot dogs, bologna, any lunch, most lunch meats, unless they're without nitrates, and they do make some. Um, sausage, salami. So be careful about your intake of those foods because they're not really good for you. I know, I like them. I like them. I like them all. But I have to be careful. So do you. We all do. In the health field, we have to eat. Be careful what we eat and what we give our loved ones to. So back to this, sorry. Uh, stomach carcinoma begins in the mucous membranes and invades the gastric wall then spreads to the regional lymphs, liver, pancreas, and colon. See how bad that can get? Real fast. I had a patient come into the hospital um, complaining that he hadn't been eating well. Two weeks later, he was dead because of stomach cancer. You know, he, he the symptoms just, sometimes they creep up on you. They creeped up on him, and before he knew it, he was, it was everywhere. So that's why it's, it's so deadly. All right. So H. pylori risk, risk factors include H. pylori, that's a pre-cancerous condition, pernicious anemia, chronic gastritis, any chronic anything can cause a cancer, right? If you know the symptoms of cancer, chronic irritation is one of them. So history of stomach cancer, it runs in the family. That's another thing. Cigarette smoking, diet high in starch, salt, pickled foods. Oh, I, I said that already, sorry. Um, patients who had the Bill Roth II procedure, the gastrojejunostomy, we're, we'll be talking about that later. Uh, gastroscopy is used to examine the interior of the stomach. That's one of the things I'll be looking at. GI series, MRI, laparoscopy. Those are all ways of diagnosing. Then there's some lab tests, your H&H, &H, hemoglobin hematocrit, albumin, liver function, a CEA, your uh, carcinogenic antigen. So stomach cancer may be treated with surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. If it's detected early, surgical options include sub total gastrectomy with lymph node dissection. Sometimes part of the esophagus or duodenum is resected. So let's look at this health promotion. Break the link between diet and digestive tract cancers. So I know you've heard this before. Healthy diet, being physical, active, maintaining a healthy weight help reduce cancer risk, eat well, a healthy diet, fiber, vitamins, and minerals, be active and maintain a healthy weight. Post-op care of patient uh, with stomach cancer. So just like any cancers, we, we wanna have to encourage them to cough and deep breathe so they're going to since they have an incision they're going to need to have uh, some sort of a pillow or blanket folded up to hold on to their incision so they can cough and deep breathe so they don't get a secondary pneumonia 
monitor for weight changes. That too can be a sign of cancer. A pain, we want to give pain medications, inadequate nutrition. Nutritional needs are much like those of the patients who has undergone surgery for peptic ulcer disease. So soft, bland foods. And then inadequate coping, page 740. This is the last thing. I think there might be another question. No, I guess not. All right, so inadequate coping. Again, let's talk about how we talk to our patients. The patient and family may need help in coping with this life-threatening illnesses. Encouraging them to talk. What do you mean when you say you'll never be able to eat anything again? What do they mean by that? Why do you feel no one's going to like you anymore? Why do you feel that you aren't going to live a normal life? What makes you feel that way? What is it that you think? Just get them to talk. Just don't be derogatory or negatory or, you know, or just ignore their feelings altogether. You're not going to be, it's, that's not going to happen. You don't want to be like that either. And you don't also don't want to give them false hope. Oh, if it's going to be fine, everything's going to be fine. Can't do that either. We just have to be a gentle ear to listen to them. All right, um, so help the patient to think about changes in daily routines that may be necessary after discharge. If chemotherapy or radiation therapy is planned, the patient needs to know what to expect. Knowledge is power. Provide the patient with information about community resources, such as home health agencies or American Cancer Society. Anytime someone's going through something I'm sure there's some sort of support group for everybody nobody understands except someone else who's gone through it so support groups are great for that reason if you're that kind of person some some people don't like to talk about it I know they like to deny that it's there but um, the best person to talk to, to about it is someone who's had it before or a pamphlet give them something to read now that we have Google it's great, we can get lots of information just as long as you don't go to Wikipedia. I, I do know some people that go to Google and look up things and then and they find the worst possible scenario and then they worry about that when that may not even be the case. So Google can be a bad thing in that sense. All right, guys, um, read your book, go over the things that I pointed out as being really important and um, if you have any questions, write them down and we can talk about it. Thank you.